how the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project leverages a unique worldwide network of independent media centers and journalists to hold power to account. This is a really unique organization that uh, works unlike any other in the world. And I'm so happy that you're all here today to tell us about OCCRP's work. So I'd like to hand it over to Dana Priest of the Washington Post, who will be hosting this discussion. So I have a real, um, I have a story to tell you about C C OCCRP because I can't help not telling it, which is um, I really discovered the organization when I started teaching eight years ago. And I just couldn't believe that I had never he heard of it before. <laughs> um, and I discovered it through discovering, uh, I did a class on imprisoned journalists and each of my students at the University of Maryland had to, had to profile an imprisoned journalist. And one of them got Khadija Ismailova in Azerbaijan, a country I'd never thought about before. <laughs> now I'm, I'm obsessed with it and I'm obsessed with Khadija. But um, then that led me to Paul Redu's dashboard, which really, uh, which has, you know, now I don't know how many millions of financial documents. And this whole time I'm thinking, how do these people do this? <laughs> really, I am so impressed by the organization. I mean, I love to, to show it to students because they complain about the public affairs person in Maryland not calling them back, and I want to I want to show them what what journalists overseas in authoritarian countries where there's barely a free press or not at all um, go through. And so, really, uh, you're my idols. <laughs> and so, with that, uh, and and one of my interns, one of my students, has worked for you as an intern, Layla. Uh, Sari Aichek, she's, um, and that changed her life. It really did. It changed the direction of her career. So for all the students out there, you know, just uh, know that they do take interns, I hope still, and that you too can do, do some of this work. It's, it's, um, it's more important now than ever. So I want to, I want to introduce you to the people who know much more about it than I do. Um, first, uh, Camille Ice who's uh, the chief of global partnerships and policy, which means she, she deals with civil society and policymakers and, and donors and thinks strategically about the direction uh, of the organization. And we have uh, Miranda uh, Petruchek, who um, I keep running into in various places. She's joining us from Sarajevo. Hi, Miranda. Uh, and she's been with the organization for a long time and has seen it grown. She's the deputy editor of Regional Stories and uh, Central Asia. And then we have Pavla uh, Holzova, <laughs> who uh, has been with the organization also for a while. And she's the head of um, the um, regional editor for Central Europe. And also the founder of the Czech Center for Investigative Reporting, which I'm sure was not an easy thing to do given the direction that the Czech Republic is taking now. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to finally say before I start in on your questions that even though you all have been doing this for a while, we in the United States could not be more needing of this. And I understand that you're opening a a U.S. A US uh, bureau or hiring an editor or something, you could talk more about that. You know, who would have thought that we have, we in the United States had had to worry about democracy, but we do. And we know that what undermines democracy more than almost anything is corruption. So uh, I'm hoping that you can talk about later how, how you can lead us um, to do the kind of reporting that has been as impactful in your countries in the US where money laundering through US banks and US real estate schemes and all the other schemes is, is such, a big, uh, such a big deal. So with that, I'll start with Camille and just uh, set the foundation, Camille. Um, how, how does it work? How do you do this? 
And what makes you different from really there's only a handful of groups that do this kind of collaboration. So it's not a, it's not a big universe, but I feel like you're, you're different uh, and you certainly are um, experienced. So if you could just sort of lay that foundation from uh, for us, that'd be great. Sure. Great. Thank you, Donna. Um, and thank you to the Center for Cooperative Media, uh, Stephanie, Sarah, all the work that you guys are doing. Um, really happy to be here and to have the opportunity to talk a little bit more about OCCRP. Um, I thought just to kick us off, I could talk a little bit about our model and what makes it so unique. Um, try to give you guys the, the key components um, and then we can talk a little bit about our story work, which my colleagues can weigh in on. Um, so I think what makes our model so unique um, you know, in the wider media world and also in collaborative media um, is the fact that OCCRP is both publishing the stories and producing the content um, that empowers a whole range of actors um, to push for accountability in different ways, uh, while at the same time developing and equipping the global network that it takes to actually do those work, to do that work and to produce those stories um, with the whole range of stuff, the partners, the data, um, the tools, uh, and a mix of security. Um, so there are four areas that I thought I would quickly kick us off with and highlight. Um, the first one uh, is really just to say that um, we have a laser focus on organized crime, financial crime, and corruption. Um, the content uh, is critical to the wider change you know, we hope to see in the world um, by doing this kind of reporting that really holds power to account. Um, but it's also critical because of the level of expertise um, that is developed by the participating journalists in the network. Um, and that can build over time by working on a series of these kinds of stories. Um, the second element that's so critical um, is that we are cross-border. Again, this stems from the subject matter, from the content. Corruption is inherently cross-border. It does not stop at the borders, um, so neither can we in terms of our work. Um, it's something we often like to talk about. Uh, if we think about the founding of the organization, it's really illustrative of how we've grown since then um, and the basis for our model. Uh, since that time in 2006, when the organization got off the ground. Our two co-founders, um, they were actually at a training and they found that they were um, investigating the same energy trading uh, situation. They found that they not only needed each other um, because they had different parts of his story, um, but they needed partners in about eight other countries. Uh, they needed data from those countries. They needed journalists they could trust um, and they needed common insurance. Uh, and that's actually how the CCRP off the, got off the ground. Um, historically, we've been most active in Europe and Eurasia uh, in the last few years, um, and that's including the Caucasus, Eastern Europe, um, Eurasia. But we've pushed out in the last few years um, with our first set of Africa editors in Latin America um, and starting to get underway in the Middle East um, and Asia. And as Dana mentioned, um, we we're very excited to be hiring our first US editor. Um, but that cross-border nature um, really underscores the, the collaboration is at the heart of the OCCRP model. Um, we couldn't produce the stories that, um, that we have been um, without that presence in several countries. The third aspect of this um, is really that we talk about ourselves as an investigative reporting platform more than an outlet. OCCRP has more than 40 editors, a set of core editors at our headquarters office in Sarajevo um, that coordinate uh, across the regions and also more than 20 regional editors at this point um, that, is wor that are working with more than 50 at this point, 52, what we call member centers around the world. So member centers are typically smaller investigative outlets, independent media, um, in some cases, the last, last standing independent media in countries where it is significantly under threat. Um, member centers themselves are regular partners on these investigations. And over time, they're at our conferences. Um, they're working with other journalists and editors across the network um, to really build that trust and understanding of who has what to produce these stories. In addition, we worked with all over 60, so last year it was 60 publishing partners around the world. This is the Guardians, the Deutsche Zeitung and other bigger papers. Um, and this model, uh, it both, I'll, I'll get into the other part of the platform in a second, um, but it's really critical to understanding the kind of reach and impact we've been able to have over the years um, in that it allows OCCRP to take these cross-border stories, publish them in English for a global audience, 
um, but also work with our local partners um, that are publishing locally for local audiences and in local languages. Um, the fourth part of this just really comes down to all the tools and resources or the stuff um, that it takes to do this work in the first place. It's basically the second part of what we mean by a platform. Um, but central to our work at OCCRP is the technological development um, that's happened over the years, the building of in-house open source software and tools, um, OCCRP Aleph in particular, um, which has become a real um, a leading tool in the industry for tracking down financial crime with over 2 billion um, records at this point, um, lots of banking information, uh, and it's just a common tool that's shared throughout our network. Um, and that also facilitates secure communication. Um, so just there's more to all of this that we can get into. I'll just highlight that that wider platform and support system, um, it's all critical to the collaboration around the tools, around the security uh, and having those trusted partners to be able to tell the stories in the first place. Okay, great. That's very clear. And, and we'll come back to questions everybody in about at a uh, 2.40, so, um, if you have any, send them in. Uh, so you gave a big view. How about how about we go to Miranda for a minute and talk about actually trying to do stories about organized crime and corruption? I mean, this is this is dangerous work, and Miranda's been there since the founding. I met her in Washington um, two years ago introduced by one of Washington's leading anti-corruption crusaders, uh, Charles Davidson. And then, as I said, I've, I've run into her uh, since then. She seems to be all over the place. But I thought you could tell us about, um, well, you could tell us about any particular story you would like to, but, you know, the Az Aziri laundromat is, is just a, such a great example of what real deep dive digging you guys do and and also the breadth it's it's just it's just is you know one story after another i i don't know if you're even done with the laundromat series it seems like it could go on forever unfortunately so Wonderful. Miranda, you want <laughs> thank Hi. you dada Hi. <laughs> um i mean laundromat is really a gift that keeps giving in a way that I think we probably have exploited maybe 5% of the data. And uh, what's so amazing about it is that, um, you know, every once in a while, and I, and, and I say that like every couple of weeks, uh, we would come across a new name, a new company, and then we would go back to Olive and suddenly it would pop up in the laundromat. So um, I can't even um, count the number of stories that have come out of it. And what's been great is um, that you know, our colleagues uh, were able to share and exploit this data together and produce story for years, really. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, as a Bejani laundromat, I remember the first meeting we had on it. It was just a few of us and we met in uh, Romania in Bucharest. And I remember that day when we were going through, um, you know, transactions and then seeing a major names in European politics and realizing that, um, you know, Azeris have been paying off people in Europe in order to um, basically bribe them not to speak about a human rights record and the political prisoners and all these topics that Azerbaijan has spent so much money into trying to um, hide and present themselves as a modern democracy. So that's one of the examples. And I, you know, I wanted to build on, um, I was actually uh, one of the you know, first people who joined was ECRP. And I remember when we first joined, it was like a small Sarajevo office and it was uh, uh, Drew, our, uh, one of the co-founders. Um, it was uh, one of the researchers, uh, Leila, and uh, another Leila, <laughs> and me. Uh -huh. And we were sitting in this tiny office in Sarajevo. And then you know we had a few co colleagues in Europe who were working with us. And I remember our first conference was probably just 10 of us. And then now it's it's a basically a huge organization with hundreds of journalists. And you know, for me personally, what's most important is you know when I got to know OCCRP, when I first met Drew, you know he was my mentor together with Rosemary and some of the other people who joined, and they taught me everything I know. And 
what is amazing about OCCRP is that, for example, now I'm teaching everything I know to journalists in countries we don't have traditional investigative reporting, in countries which are, uh, you know, not democracies, they're dictatorship, they don't have public records, and we are able to produce amazing, you know, uh, in investigation about, you know, crime and corruption. And, you know, I'll just mention one most recently, and, and, and this is, I think, really the power of collaboration and like working with great people. We produced our first investigation in Turkmenistan, a country that is, I mean, <laughs> so close. What? Uh, and, and we were able to obtain not just documents to prove it, but we actually did a story that really is about lives of people. You know, we uncovered that they've been having hmm. massive food shortages for the past five years. And uh, we got the documents to show that one of the people tasked with bringing food to the country is a nephew of the president. Um, very, very real, very human story in, in the most difficult place on earth to do investigative reporting next to South Korea. Oh, no, sorry, North Korea. <laughs> all right. Well, fantastic. So first of all, all you students out there, look up Turkmenistan, my guess is, you have never thought about it before. Um, uh, but can I just follow up, Miranda? How, how does being, I mean, I don't want you to talk too much about security because it's not something you, know, you probably want to talk much about, but how does being part of an organization help in that way? Help you personally? It happens in a great way. First, I'm not alone. Um, and I'll, 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 I'll actually speak about from the point of like reporters who work with that, but also from my own perspective. I remember like many reporters in the world basically uh, face threats and they have nobody to speak to. And I remember I was once mentioning to a reporter who said she found herself in a dangerous situation. She sent an email to her editor saying, if you don't hear from me, I'm in trouble. And the editor never got back to her. I remember the day when I received the death threats my editor was left and right, you know, getting me out of country, finding somebody to take me out. I mean, all the things that you would need to feel safe um, in a really bad situation. But also um, the safety is in the numbers. And for example, mm -hmm. when we work in these like really dangerous places, you know, our Azerbaijani journalists never go and expose themselves. It's always one of the editors who will make a call or sign the document and, you know, sign the request so they would not be exposed. And then, um, you know, we, you know, so we spend a lot of time teaching our reporters how to be stay safe and actually um, discussing every story we are working on and thinking about what's the safe, what's the risk, how we can mitigate the risk and how we can continue to do job in, you know, some of the countries. And that sometimes means that, you know, some of our reporters don't put their names on stories. So, you know, you will see yeah. that there are some, uh, we did a big expose in Kyrgyzstan um, about uh, 700 million theft. Um, and none of the reporters uh, put their names on it. Uh, mm -hmm. Our source was killed as we were reporting it. Um, you know, very brave reporters from Central Asia were, you know, facing threats and many risks doing that story. We were able to do it because we were, you know, one, one unit working hard and nobody had their name out. So that's, um, you know, the power is in the number and the security is a number. Okay, thank you. That's uh, hard to fathom, really. Uh, I just wanted to turn to you for a minute. Are you, are you in Prague? Well, right now I am not, but usually I am based in Prague. Okay, okay, good. Um, I noticed, you know, still on the security matter, it's not just personal security, but it's the story, right? And I know that your motto is killing the journalist won't kill the story. Americans might not relate to that. Can you tell us a little bit about, you know, what the motto, how that motto came to be and maybe talk a little bit about the cartel project that, um, that you were involved in and I was involved in for the first time. So. Thanks for being here. Yeah, uh, actually, the, the the motto for me is much more personal, much more personal experience. Unfortunately, um, I'm living in in Prague, what means in the center of European Union, and in 2018, 21st of February, my colleague and close friend was murdered. He was investigative journalist, 
Jan Kuciak, and he was murdered at home together with him, with his fiance. They had like a couple of weeks before the before the wedding, and actually they their last call with their families. It was about the wedding. You know, they were talking about the wine mm. and about the dress. And uh, and then um, uh, assassin for hire came to her to, to their home and and shot them both. So for us it was kind of priority uh, not to let it be because only a couple months before Jano Kuciak was killed, uh, another journalist in European Union was murdered as well, Daphne Caruana Galizia. And we were really scared that this could be some kind of a trend, that you know we are not mm. safe anymore within the borders of European Union. And uh, you know, of course, after my after Jano, my my friend and my colleague with whom I work on a story that was about to expose the ties between the Prime Minister of Slovakia Robert Fico to Italian mafia Andrangheta, uh, I, I just wanted to you know lock me in a bathroom and cry but there was no time for it and and you know uh drew from OCCRP and, and Miranda came to Prague and they just all talked me and explained me like hey you can't give up and you you really need to work on because if you if if this would silence you as a journalist this is what they actually wanted what what those people who hired those assassins for hire they wanted to silence journalists so if you will, you know, don't speak up now, then they won. So we just gathered a team of people, uh, including like people and the families of Jano and Martina, those who, who those victims of the murder, and we kept on working. And it was last mm. three years were crazy intense. It was really super intense and I didn't have any holidays. I worked most of the weekends, but we were able to actually finish all or 95% of the stories Jano started. Yeah. And we were able to expose uh, corruption in one tiny Central European country, but on the level, it is not usually exposed. And and mm -hmm. I think this is one really one of the biggest accomplishments in my life. Yeah, no, congratulations. And you know, all, all Americans can read all these stories in English. So that's that's another thing that's really nice about uh, your platform. Uh, it opens it up to a much wider audience. And for those of you who are surprised at what I mean. You know, this is the plight of journalism and journalists in so many parts of the world, but to have it creeping into Europe is, um, is, is, is so terrible. And uh, again, to refer to ourselves makes us wonder if someday um, that can happen here. I am no doubt if we keep on this trajectory that we're on, it, it can and it will. Um, yeah, actually that's, that's so one of the- I wanted to talk about yeah. Sorry. Yeah, that, that's one of the things I wanted to highlight. We we really didn't see it coming. We believe that you that the journalists in in European Union they are threatened by the lawsuits, not by being murdered. So if you believe that it can't happen in your country, think twice. Yeah. Do you feel that um, that has gotten better in the sense that? Uh, you have OCCRP, you have your organization, maybe the authorities are going to think twice about taking that kind of step again? Uh, yeah, because, you know, after Jana was killed, um, we not only exposed how the murder was done by our own investigation, but we also gathered 57 terabytes of data from the murder investigation that police collected. And 57 terabytes just, you know, for to have some, some idea, all Panama Papers, it was four terabytes. So this is more than mm. 10 times more. And because we understood that it's not in human power to actually go through all the data and understand what was happening in Slovakia, if we were talking about state capture or if we were talking about mafia state. So we created with my colleague from Slovakia, Arpad from Investigative Center of Jan Kuciak that, that only became 
that, that was founded after the, the, the murder of Jan Kuciak, we created a team that was across all the Slovak media, actually, not all the Slovak media, that, but the Slovak media we trusted. And we shared those data. So we created probably the best investigative team of journalists within Central Europe. And we went through those 57 terabytes of data. And actually, as an impact, 21 judges were are now being prosecuted. All police wow. residency, the top police management of Slovakia is now awaiting trial in pre-trial detention. Yes. One of the police presidents yes. actually committed suicide. And, and it was really like really close collaboration between journalists, but also between the civil society who actually went to the streets and stood up for us. And they showed to, to politicians that it's not okay to kill journalists. Yeah, wow, that's, that's such a feat. Um, well, you talked about civil society, and I wanted to ask Camille about your collaboration sometimes with civil society groups that we would see as advocates in journalism, um, and that's a tricky thing for journalists. Uh, so I know you've got, uh, you've collaborated before with uh, Transparency International, which is all about money laundering and, and uh, disclosure and all this sort of thing, and it takes a policy position. So can you uh, talk about that collaboration, but also how does it work for journalists to make sure that they don't get, that they aren't viewed as, as, as uh, advocates, even though they're using the data from some of these groups? Thanks. Um, so, so yeah, as you mentioned, um, advocates have a very different job. Uh, than journalists. They also have distinct competencies and skill sets um, and just really different missions. Um, but where this really came from uh, was recognition that there was a lot of redundancy um, in terms of new actors on the scene undertaking investigations um, and just across the wider world of actors that are doing those investigations, investigative journalists, um, NGOs increasingly that were doing investigations in-house and then of course law enforcement. Um, whereas, you know, for our particular subject matter um, that OCCRP journalists are looking at, um, you know, certainly on the other side of the equation, uh, very corrupt officials um, and highly organized criminal networks um, have no qualms uh, working across these silos, right? They're very organized on their side. They are very okay to work together. Um, so the idea was that how could these efforts, you know, add up to basically achieve more impact at the end of the day? What kind of collaboration could allow investigative journalists that have the skills, that have the access to data, um, and the ability to really mine the A-stacks for this kind of information and put it out there? Um, you know, how could that be brought together in a way where that information um, got into the hands of advocacy groups? Uh, in a way that allowed them to do advocacy in a more effective way, allowed them to move more quickly, um, and frankly, do the kinds of, you know, pushing worldwide advocacy campaigns or working locally, um, but pushing for change, um, pushing, pushing for policy reform, and frankly, pushing for legal action um, in ways that journalists just can and should not. Um, so our, our main partnership and way that we do this is called the Global Anti-Corruption Consortium. Um, it is, as you mentioned, Dana, a partnership chiefly with Transparency International's global anti-corruption movement. Um, the idea being that OCCRP has this global network of investigative journalists. TI has chapters all around the world. Um, it is an effort that I would say is still very much a work in progress. Um, but over the first couple of years that this has been um, in effect, if you will, um, there has been significant impact that's been achieved. So I think maybe I'll highlight that just a little bit um, and also some of the lessons learned. Um, you know, Miranda and I have talked about this extensively, so I'll probably pass it over her to talk a little bit in terms of how her own reporting um, has gone further because of this partnership. Um, but certainly, you know, a key priority is ensuring that that editorial independence is maintained, um, that journalists and our journalists are telling stories that are chiefly in the public interest, not determined by some advocacy campaign. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also super high priority in terms of when that information is shared 
with key factors being that editorial independence, um, but also frankly, the security um, of our partners and our partners around the world um, that is closely tied to that credibility. Um, the Azerbaijani laundromat, if we can just talk about that because you guys talked about that investigation a little bit earlier, but that um, is really a great illustration um, of how this has allowed for more impact over time. So that investigation was the fall of 2017. Um, it exposed a $2.9 billion slush fund um, that had run from Azerbaijan through the UK, through Scottish limited partnerships, um, and it allowed for parliamentarians in the EU to be paid off, um, essentially, uh, for not criticizing the human rights record in Azerbaijan. Um, that story is a clear example of OCCRP's collaborative method, uh, model and network uh, on the ground doing work. But the fact that we had this partnership with Transparency International and could get them some of those findings, you know, right before release, meant that TI, you know, was at the mm -hmm. doors of, of the Council of Europe um, pushing for action, for official action. Uh, we saw immediate impact um, in terms of official resignations and an official investigation that was launched. Um, the introduction of unexplained wealth orders in the UK, which was a key policy reform for getting at some of this lack of transparency in terms of where the money can move. Uh, but also, you know, Miranda used the term, it's a gift that keeps on giving. Um, that is totally true on the data front, but it's also true on the impacts front. Um, just from this investigation, we saw, you know, in the millions of dollars penalties for both Deutsche Bank and Danske Bank in 2019, in 2020, um, for their roles uh, in moving that money and laundering that money or turning a blind eye when it was coming through their systems. Um, so I'll stop there, just not to go on too long. Uh, it is something that we are, I'll just say, um, asking ourselves a ton of questions about this, you know, a few years in, in terms of what, what things work better than others. Um, you know, this was very much envisioned as advocacy groups um, being able to use the findings of investigative journalists to be more effective. Uh, but of course, in reality, you know, advocacy groups have a ton of information. Um, they have contacts, et cetera. Um, so thinking about how that information is shared and what kind of change it can create as a result. Um, we've now got a body of evidence, you know, a few years under our belt anyway, and are delighted that, um, that Sarah uh, and the center is, is looking at this because we do believe there's real room to scale here um, and to help share some of these lessons because it is not a traditional way of working. Um, and there are certainly some guardrails in there that are really important. Okay. Miranda, so, Joe, I'll add to that, but I'll Joe, stop. Yeah. Well, Joe weighs in with this is so badass. And I feel the same way. You know, like you don't have to wait for the FBI to do their job. You guys are out there doing it. And hopefully, I think there's been some times, right, that they've actually taken up some of your work and and pushed it further, right? Our, can can you talk a little bit about that? Arrests, maybe people on the sanctions list. What else? Papa, um, do you know about that? Well, maybe but, I don't know, Miranda, if you want to talk a little bit about Kyrgyzstan, but that's you're hitting precisely on it. Yeah. That these groups can actually file these kinds of dossiers, make submissions to for global Magnitsky sanctions and others um, in ways that certainly we can. But I mean, a most recent example really is um, the investigation we have done in Kyrgyzstan where we uncovered how the former uh, customs boss at the time, he was in uh, head of cust a deputy head of customs, was helping a Uyghur family, um, you know, smuggle goods into Kyrgyzstan and then on to Uzbekistan and, you know, neighboring Russia. And they basically profited with over $700 million dollars. Uh, which they moved mm -hmm. out of Kyrgyzstan using, you know, Western banks. So a lot of that money ended up in Germany, ended up in UK uh, through purchase of real estate in, in Dubai and so on. So, um, you know, our source was killed um, just before, as we were getting ready to publish um, this investigation. Um, and after we published um, TI, but also some other groups have worked on um, basically filing a dossier on this customs boss. And recently he has been added together with his wife to a Magnitsky list of sanctions, which was the first high profile name from Kyrgyzstan that was added yes. to the list. And, you know, this is something where we didn't even know it was going on. 
um, you know, people have used our findings, our documents that we have published on the website to take this action, and we only learned about it afterwards. Um, but uh, another example, which I think is great, you know, we, we have published our Turkmenistan story last week. And one of the key reasons we were able to publish the story is because the company that was uh, owned by the nephew and was bringing food to Turkmenistan was a UK um, shell company. Uh, but as UK introduced the beneficial owners registered, register, they, he had to disclose that he is a beneficial owner. So um, TI hmm. actually sent us an email this week and they wanted to have a meeting and chat about you know, what our findings are. And you know, nothing that we you know, did not publish. Um, mm -hmm. And it was amazing that they were interested actually to take action on that story. And you know, Turkmenistan is you know, a place where very few people care about. There is uh, very little uh, uh, written about uh, you know, a big humanitarian cri crisis that's been taking place in the country. I mean, if you think about it, you know, they have food rations and a family mm -hmm. can buy two chicken tights a month. I mean, th this is the rationing that's taking place in that country. And they have a limit on how much oil they can buy and how much sugar. So, you know, we can publish the story and some people will read it. And obviously there will be some outrage to those who can access the story in Turkmenistan. Uh, but the fact that somebody in the West is actually listening, um, has seen the story, see that they can do some, some action um, on such a story, I think is really, really, um, I mean, it's, it's, yeah. it's really amazing to see. And, you know, for me, that's a very rewarding part of what I do, because, um, you know, when you work in the places that very few people know about, like, you know, Kyrgyzstan, which is this tiny country in Central Asia, or, you know, Uzbekistan or Azerbaijan, even in, in, in some way, having people take action and actually try to, you know, because one part of like working in these countries is that people who rule these countries, I mean, they've been ruling them for decades. Those are people who act with full impunity. There is no action that will happen inside the country. So the fact that there's somebody listening in the West and actually is willing to take action is I think really encouraging and a very strong message because uh, rulers in these countries are used to, um, they're used to, um, you know, intimidate journalists, imprison them, and you know, face no consequences. And this way, you know, it shows the power of investigation and that you know somebody's paying attention. Absolutely. And even though those countries are pretty far from the U.S., can one of you talk for a minute about the about the financial links to the U.S.? We know there are many with the uh, Azerbaijan ruling family. But what will it mean that you, if you, if you start an office here, what will that mean for your cross-border collaboration and your ability to um, tell the story of the U.S. and how it's linked to the to corruption all over the world? It will be very important in a way that you know, you know, the more people you have, you can call to and say, "Hey, we have this story. There's a U.S. link. Can you?" you know, dig into this, you know, you know, you, yeah. there will be somebody who is going to not say, well, I'm busy. I have many other projects as we all do. They'll be like, okay, I'll go and do it. And, you know, I, I remember, you know, first time that the U.S. played a big role, it was when we were investigating one of the biggest drug lords in Europe, Darko Saric. He actually had a number of companies through Deliver in U.S. And nobody knows, knew that he was behind this company. And we actually had to fly a reporter to go to Deliver, pick up a records. I mean, imagine if we, uh, you know, had a U.S. reporter, we'd just go there and like get the records right. for us and, and, and share it. And obviously, you know, a lot of it is about sourcing. I mean, the U.S., um, um, uh, you know, DOJ, they're conducting amazing investigation, especially in some of the people in our part of the world. And, you know, being mm -hmm. able to develop sources and have somebody on the ground. And then obviously some of the places like New York, Miami, uh, very, um, you know, top places with where people put a lot of money yeah. in. So... Um, that it will be amazing opportunity for uh, even a better and stronger journalism that can come, uh, you know. From what well, we if do. I didn't have two jobs already, I would join you. Maybe we'll, <laughs> we would love to have you. <laughs> or else I'll figure, I'll figure out a way to have my students uh, who want to do investigations. You know, that's a good thing. This new well, generation. We, do, we still take interns, so your students are very welcome yeah. to. <laughs> apply okay. to uh, join us. And hopefully our office in Sarajevo will be open and running soon. In, soon. 
um, and COVID will be over and they'll be yeah. able to physically be present uh, with all right, of us. Right, right. If I can just okay, talk gonna... to you. Um, in yep, terms go of, ahead. Yeah, just also because there's a real, I mean, I just think a key part of this is the moment that we're in. Um, Dana, you know, you noted at the outset of the conversation, uh, it's no secret that um, our democracy in the United States needs some work. Um, and for all the talk about the role of dark money in the United States um, and the, the various things that that opaque money can fund or has funded from, you know, election interference or foreign influence or the rise of polarization uh, in the United States, um, the reality is that a lot of the money that's coming into the U.S. is laundered before it gets here. Um, there are a lot of vehicles outside the U.S. that make that possible, but also within the U.S., you know, looking at real estate, for example, there's a lot of place to put that money. Um, and if U.S. Mm -hmm. media continue telling that story um, and really, you know, excel at accountability reporting and meet this moment, um, OCCRP, you know, we have this, we have this global presence, we have these reporters and this ground game around the world, you know, people who know the local contacts, who, who can get the land records, um, you know, who right. are already part of this network and excel at tracking that kind of financial crime. Um, and in this moment that we're in, you know, with, with financial strains for U.S. newsrooms, um, just thinking about partnering in these ways, you know, our U.S. editor is our first official editorial presence here. Um, but we really hope that it's just the beginning of a larger operation. Um, and, you know, a member center network won't work the same way with U.S. media, but really getting to figure that out um, and how we tell these bigger stories and look at the origins, you know, of some of that money. Well, and luckily, I mean, newsrooms like the Washington Post, uh, New York Times, others are much more open to collaborations than they used to be. So, I mean, that's one good thing. <laughs> Uh, so I want to go to the questions now, and I have one from a science and healthcare journalist who who says, "How can I, how can I help if I don't cover these particular topics? Um, do you have a need for science and healthcare specialists, journalists, um, and and just generally, how can journalists in the U.S. and Canada who aren't restrained yet?" Um, Help OCCRP. I mean, healthcare is such a huge issue right now. One of you want to take that? Have you ever done a science type investigation, healthcare products, things um, like that? I mean, recently, um, obviously, with COVID, we have been uh, following a lot of stories um, involving COVID, and a lot of it has been follow the money type of COVID stories with, uh, you know, right. investigating the public procurement and, uh, you know, quality of equipment and masks that uh, governments around Europe have been buying. And obviously we have been, uh, we have built a big database mm -hmm. um, and collected all the records on the procurement across Europe in order to do this project. But I think, you know, anybody who has a story really is very open to pitch it to us and, uh, you know, reach out our editorial team and yeah. talk to us about ideas. And, you know, if you need help in one of the, you know, parts of the world we cover, obviously uh, we will try to do our best and help. I, I think this, you know, yeah. science is a big topic. Um, you know, our traditional expertise is more of like follow the money side. So it's always great to partner with the experts in different fields who can actually contribute and make our reporter better by having another angle in the story. So. Yeah, and if you um, if there are reporters in in the U.S. or Canada or Europe who have great international stories in mind and might already have some sources, um, I think you know letting letting you all know to see if you can help is is a great thing. Which leads to another uh, question, which is how how do you vet the reporters that you uh, that are in OCCRP? I mean. Um. I, for us, the measure is the story. <laughs> yeah. And it really is. I mean, we, you know, we, um, you know, welcome people to do if they have a good idea or if we, you know, need the help from somebody in a, in a part of the world, you know, we'll try to work on the story. And, you know, many mm -hmm. of those who have started with single story, you know, are still with us. 
Um, and I remember when we first started working with Pavla and, you know, she would come to us and actually Pavla, you know, uh, you know, I was leading the, um, you know, our Central Asia Azerbaijan team and Pavla would come to us and say, I have this data on Azeris in Czech Republic. I don't know who they are, but these stories will be good. <laughs> and that's, you know, and we yeah. did our, I remember we, we did our first Tajik story with Pavla's data about, uh, you know, properties owned by uh, head of railways. And his wife. I mean, this was mm. Pavla coming to us. And, you know, obviously we love Pavla and we'll never let her not be part of his CRP. But basically that's it. Um, if you have a good story, if you want to, you know, I, one thing I really appreciate about, you know, both Drew and Paul, they're uh, believers in, in humans and uh, they give opportunity. <laughs> and if you, um, if you uh, deliver, you, you get more opportunity mm -hmm. and it, it's been always like that. And I, you know, it's a great environment to do stories because, the, you know, yeah, as, yeah. as long as you have stories, um, you know, yeah. everybody's welcome. So Pablo, we have a question about um, security again. And, and one of, and the questioner is asking whether uh, some of the well-known press advocacy groups like Committee to Protect Journalists or Reporters Without Borders has been helpful in providing advice or anything else to journalists uh, who need to protect themselves against harassment they, or threats? They, yes, they are great when actually raising awareness about the, the threats on journalists. And they are also very helpful when you feel you are threatened. If, if the politicians are threatening you because of your reporting, if you are threatened on, on social networks and so on, they keep uh, the archive of such a threat. So it's much easier than to persuade the police that you need police protection because something is really happening to you because they have the track record and they can stand up for you. And they also were very useful in my case because during the, the murder investigation of Jana Kuciak, um, I went to Slovakia to give witness testimony, but it ended up as interrogation and the police seized my phone. And I could not really do anything about it. Uh, the police took it. They just said that there's no way you can not give us your phone. Uh, so uh, they, together with OCCRP, started a campaign. And as a result, the police didn't touch the phone and give it back to me untouched without any copy of oh. the data. And uh, and they oh. even took it to the European Parliament. So, so it was... a. Uh, a really great help from their side. Yeah. Yeah. And I know they both have some emergency funds for people who need to get out of their countries very quickly. I mean, there's nothing more important than, than that kind of safety yeah. measure. Yeah. Fortunately, yeah. I never needed to explore yeah. those emergency funds. Yeah. Um, well, okay. This is a, such a softball question. What is the best way, asks one questioner, to donate or for financially support the work you all are doing at OCCRP? <laughs> Camille? Uh, I can take that one. Sure. Um, so uh, the short answer is to become an OCCRP accomplice, uh, an accomplice in our fight for truth and justice. Um, the accomplice program is our membership program. Um, that is primarily based of uh, readers, um, our newsletter readers, um, and other supporters of our work. This is a program that we just got off the ground last year, um, but just finished up a spring campaign that went quite well. But it's really, um, you know, just scratching the surface of what we hope support from the wider public will be going forward and really investing in this investigative journalism yeah. as a public good. So I'm sure Lauren, if she hasn't already, yes, okay. It's already, <laughs> the link is in the chat. Um, I'll that up. Okay. But it also uh, comes with some conversations with a number of our editors and getting a little bit of a deep dive into the investigation. So um, would really love uh, members of this community to become part of that one. And I'm sure that you um, always need uh, uh, forensic financial analysts too. You know, there's probably, I'm gonna just guess that there's some uh, volunteer help that you can use uh, now and again for some of the financial records that you're trying to understand. That's just from my own experience. So 
Um, okay, we have another question about ICIJ, which is probably the oldest um, collaborative uh, organization, and they would like to know whether your work has overlapped with their Panama papers, their Paradise papers, or the Fin FinCEN uh, investigations. Do you do you work together with them? We do, and actually, I'm a member, and I'm a very proud member of ICJ. And uh, what is really, really amazing is that you know there's our work is so complementary. I mean, like, yeah. you know, the data set they bring into the game with, you know, the, the Panama Papers, Paradise Paper, I mean, there's a mind blowing investigation, but at the same time, you have this great other sets of records that you can pair. So, you know, very often what happens, you have Paradise Papers and then you have Laundromat or like Panama Papers and Laundromat. And, you know, again, these are all, you know, these are, you know, resources for investigation that's gonna, the investigation that are gonna last for many years. You know, like literally years after Panama right. Papers, we ended up uncovering a big story involving Azerbaijan and a company that was in the records in Panama Papers. So it's, I mean, like, yeah. I, you know, I think I, I cannot imagine the world without, you know, ICJ, without Forbidden Stories, obviously without OCCRP. I think we need each other and we need to work with each other. And, you know, Pavla is a member too, and she's been, you know, working on investigation with I, I say, Jay, and I think, you know, we do, together, we do a great work and a very important work for this society. Yep. Uh, okay, another good question here about how is, how is this um, branch in the U.S. going to work? Are you, you're hiring an editor, but are there going to be reporters too? So I can hop in on this one. Um, so the U.S. editor, as mentioned, is the first um, higher for this new editorial presence. Uh, the idea is that initially um, this work will build on our collaboration with U.S. outlets in the past. Um, you know, BuzzFeed is a key one where we did some pretty big work in the last couple of years. Um, but I will just say that we want to be pretty clear that, you know, we work, know that things will work differently in the U.S. than they do in certainly a lot of the parts of the world that we've been working in to date. Um, you know, U.S. media is historically not as collaborative in, as in some of these other places. Um, so the idea is that the editor will be working with existing outlets and seeing where we can do joint stories, you know, clarify what that means for publication, um, and then be building that team out over time. So, um, you know, a lot of our OCCRP staff currently is almost everybody but the reporters because we have this network of member centers um, and publishing partners, um, but that additional team will have a mix of probably editorial um, responsibilities, you know, as that plan is fleshed out. Yeah. And again, as more outlets accept collaborations as part of their model, um, I'm sure you're going to have lots of people wanting to work with you. So um, I did my first, my was the cartel project recently. And, and it was, it was, uh, it was so fantastic to work with all these foreign journalists, it really was. Uh, so I have a, I have two questions. We're getting close to um, uh, to the end here. So one of them is, uh, how do you do fact checking? <laughs> like kind of cross border problem. Uh, how how do you do fact checking, especially if you're doing something original where you can't just turn to the clips. You know, you pull your hair out, right? And is laughing already. <laughs> I'm laughing because we actually have this amazing lady called Birgit. She's a German. I think she speaks about nine languages. And she has trained the army of fact checkers who basically grill us until we are, you know, we scream in pain. <laughs> but then I know that these stories are, you know, bulletproof. <laughs> and really ours. I mean, that's, I think fact checking is one of the prides of OCCRP. And uh, we really have a very... A painful system that uh, causes a lot of grievances <laughs> and um, people suffer a lot. But like once you pass the OCCRP fact checking, after some counseling and you know <laughs> rest, <laughs> you become a really kick-ass reporter. I have to say that. So I would recommend it as a as a, as a very good medicine for good investigative reporting. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I love that. Okay, I'll yeah, I kind of remember that one. Um, how about a uh, question about, let's see, I have one from an organization called Democracy Watch News, which says it could be a potential partner. 
Um, so how do partners, how would you like them to try to, or potential partners get in touch with you? Is there the web, something other than the website? Is there a person that they could talk to? I think no. I saw um, but so for now, um, as Miranda said, you know, if there's particular story ideas, you can simply send an email to info at OCCRP.org for now. Um, we'll make sure that that gets to the right place. Uh, the idea also, I would just say is, you know, if you have candidates or friends who would be strong candidates for this U.S. editor position, the sooner we get that hired, the idea is that we have someone here on the ground from the editorial side um, to really get into those potential stories. Um, so the sooner we get to get filled, that would be an immediate contact um, or your primary contact rather um, in terms of figuring out those collaborations. Uh, and in the meantime, by all means, send an email uh, to that address. Okay. Uh, I just want to finish up with um, the question about the murder of the Slovak journalist uh, and what, if anything, the investigation has led to in terms of long-term systematic change. You know, that was such a stunning, um, terrible thing. And yeah, we, we, we actually still don't know. It's too early to say. Uh, the, the immediate change was enormous. Uh, there is a new president, there is a new government, totally different that from the previous one that ruled Slovakia for 12 years. And, uh, but to see if this is a long-term change, well, yeah, there is one very visible long-term change and there's kind of a emancipation of Slovak society. They understand mm -hmm. that they don't, they, that, that if they want a change, they need to go to the streets and demand a change. And those people ha are the change makers. They, they can't just sit and wait for someone else to do it. They just need to do it themselves. And I think like this could be a really long-term change in the society, this kind of emancipation and, and will to take part in, in political decisions. But regarding mm -hmm. the system, we still need to wait and see. It's, it's very fragile. It's very revolutionary still. And actually, there was one more question. Uh, we will know about the trial on 15th of June. Uh, the, mm -hmm. the Supreme Court will decide if the lead suspect in the murder investigation is going to be set free or if they are going to, to return the case back to the special court. Mm. OK. Well, it's 3 o'clock. That went by really fast. Um, I want to thank you all for being here, but more than that, for your work. And I can't imagine anything more valuable, honestly. Uh, and I'm going to say something I was not asked to say, but, you know, journalism costs money. <laughs> and um, it's not free unless you have Jeff Bezos. And then, you know, you don't have to worry so much. Don't tell my editors I said that. But uh, no, I'm, I'm serious because we, we kind of take that for granted. So uh, thank you for making your website for free for all of us to, to enjoy and be inspired by. <laughs>